Hi everybody, it's Christina. Welcome to day one of the Coming Out of the Broom Closet free five day challenge. I hope everyone's doing really well. I hope you're having a wonderful day, productive day. It has been um, rainy here. It's been raining all morning. I actually love rainy days. It's one of my favorite types of days. For some reason, I don't know why, I just, I prefer the gloom <laughs> over the sunshine. Though I suppose if I lived in a place where it was like gloomy all the time, I probably wouldn't like it as much. Alright, looks like microphone is good. Looks like people are starting to come in. Hi, happy Monday. Let's get to where I can see comments. Susie's here, Rachel's here. Lisa's here, Summer's here, Marissa's here. Yay! <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I'm so happy you guys made it. Hi there. Lisa says, love the sound of spring rain. I mean, I sleep like a baby when it's raining in the morning. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. <clears throat> okay. We'll go ahead and just get started here. Rachel says, Rain and ocean waves are common meditation music for me. Me too. And I can't say her name out loud, but it's A-L-E-X-A, -E you know, the thing that you, ha you get from Amazon. Because if I say her name, then she'll start talking to me, and I don't want that to happen. But she has this app that is for thunderstorms, and I'll put that on, like, during, like, you know, if it's like, if I want some quiet time or I'm just doing some writing or something like that, I'll turn on thunderstorms, even though it, it could be, like, sunny outside, you know, <laughs> but I'll turn on thunderstorms and I love it. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Summer. Good to see you. Happy Monday. So, hi, my name is Christina Quick. We have a lot of new members in the group as of since we've done the last challenge. In fact, the last challenge that we did, what was it? It was the, wasn't it the Conquer Your Financial Fears? Uh, that was a really, really good challenge. We did that, like, November of last year, I think it was. So, it's been a little while. We're wrapping up March now. So this is the first challenge of 2018. So it's super, super exciting. If you are brand new to the group, welcome. It's so good to finally meet you. Um, now would be a good opportunity to introduce yourself, to say hi, and just connect with me. Rachel says, I believe it was the financial one with the money goals and mindset. Yeah, I still need to get that up in the my website, the members area. I still need to get that up. I lost my VA. <laughs> she's been very, she's been too busy for me, so I'm gonna have to start shopping around for a new VA. Um, so if you are a VA and you have experience with social media scheduling, give me a shout out because I would love to connect with you and give you some work. Because <laughs> at this point, I am like two weeks backed up. I need help, and I need help like bad. <laughs> like today, I need help. Yeah. So. Um, this you're in the heart centered spiritual business support group and this support group is my baby this is like my reason for being this is this group actually gets me up in the morning yes i have like my courses and one-on-one -on -one clients and coaching and things like that but i don't have to do that every single day of the week so one of the ways that i really stay committed to my business and stay in my vortex and showing up is in this group i mean this group is literally everything to me everybody in this group is i literally think that you're like my BFF. We are all business BFFs here. And that's the kind of energy that we're really going for here. And I love it. I mean, this is probably one of, it's not, I know I'm biased, but this is probably one of the best groups on Facebook and in the world, in the universe for spiritual entrepreneurs, especially tarot readers, oracle readers, Reiki healers, spiritual life coaches. So if you fit in any of under that big umbrella, this is definitely the group for you. So if you haven't heard a little bit about my story, I'll go ahead and just share the five minute version because I swear we start off all of the challenges like this. But if you're brand new, I want to just connect with you for a minute and just tell you a little bit about myself and how I got started and why this group is so, so important. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Good to see you. Rachel says, I've got a recommendation. Okay, send the recommendation my way because I'm at the point where I'm like, I need to hire someone today or tomorrow, you know, I just, I need help. <laughs> Hi, Ashley. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us here. So my name is Christina Quick. Again, I'm the Tarot Biz Mentor. I suddenly lost my job, found myself unemployed in 2011, 
And it, it was just like this steady stream of just going to different jobs established. I was a barber, a beautician. I did hair, nails. I was in the beauty industry and I worked in salons, worked, managed in salons. And also I sold um, equipment to salons and sold products. So I was also in sales. And 2011, I basically found myself laid off. I was told Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving in 2011, that the shop that I was working at in all three locations were going to be closing. And so they were building a new location like six months from that point. And that's when it was going to be ready. And I was like, at that point, you know, I had already worked for other places that had done similar things to me. And I decided that I was going to finally finally start my own business and really start taking it seriously. I had dabbled in MLMs for a long time. I did, you know, like Arbonne and Mary Kay and things like that. And I had, I'd been selling online for ages. I mean, I had done drop shipping since I was a teenager. So, but, so I had online selling experience, but I didn't have <clears throat> enough experience to like, replace my income. That was the main thing. You know, I was making anywhere from 16 to $20 an hour doing hair plus tips. And I had a really good solid client base. And so I was used to a certain type of lifestyle. And as soon as I got laid off from that, it was just, you know, it was full on panic mode. And I was also taking care of my very sick father-in-law who passed just a few months later. And I was going through the things, you know, as we do when our parents pass or anyone we love, I was going through the things and figuring out what I was going to keep and not keep. And I ended up finding a pack of tarot cards that somehow managed to follow me about 3,000 miles from um, the West Coast all, into, all the way up into the Midwest. And I thought I had lost these tarot cards and I knew for sure that it wasn't a whole tarot card deck. So... I knew that I was working, whatever it was, was not going to be complete anyways. So I actually sat down, got my tarot cards out. It was the Mythic Tarot, by the way, if you're interested in knowing what my first deck was. It was the Mythic Tarot by Liz Dean, I believe. She's an astrologist, and it was based on um, Greek mythology. And so I was very much into Greek mythology at that point. Hi, Tammy. Good to see you. So I'm going through these cards and I'm looking things up online and lo and behold, it was a full tarot card deck. It was, it was all 78 cards were there. Whereas I had counted that before I had left and there was like a couple cards missing and things like that. I didn't take stock of what card was actually missing. I wish I could have gone, I wish I would have noticed that. I wish I would have, you know, paid attention to that, but I didn't. And so <clears throat> I was thinking back because at that point I was looking for anything I was desperate right like my car had gotten repoed I didn't have a vehicle I, my husband didn't have a vehicle he had a hybrid his his battery died it was gonna be like two three thousand dollars um, to replace the hybrid battery and so and we just got into this house and we just got into you know with that having a house comes a whole bunch of financial burdens and things and then having to deal with, you know, a family member that had passed. It was just a really hard time in my life. And so I was looking for anything. You know, I tried, like, those uh, stuffing envelopes and, like, filling out surveys. And I was just looking for anything to try to make some money online. And when I found this tarot card deck in the garage and that wasn't actually supposed to be there, like, I'm not sure how it actually appeared, but it did. Um... I never really, I didn't set out to be a tarot reader. I've always been really interested in tarot reading and astrology and, you know, using Ouija boards and things like that. But it was never like, I never wanted to grow up and be a tarot reader, if that makes sense. It's just kind of something I fell into. And it's really interesting because it's something that although I fell into it, it's like, I'm not sure how it really happened because there were so many different forces at play like around me that were cons literally conspiring for this to happen and at that point in time I was also very depressed I was very overweight I was almost 300 pounds and I was my health was really bad and I was borderline diabetic and I just wasn't taking care of my body at all I wasn't taking care of myself at all period right I think a lot of you can probably relate to that 
So I was just in this dark night of the soul, right? And I remember thinking to myself, I remember that there were these commercials about Miss Cleo. Give me a comment or a heart if you remember the Miss Cleo commercials, the psychic hotline commercials. Well, I had a thought in my head. I remembered those from being a teenager, and I was like, wow, I wonder if that actually even exists, right? I wonder if that's even really a thing. And I was just kind of grasping at straws at this point. Rachel remembers. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, Marissa remembers. Miss Cleo is like one of my spirit guides. I love Miss Cleo. But anyways, I digress. So I was just looking for anything. And I was like, you know, I wonder if that's a real thing. Because at that point, I thought it's all scripted. Um, none of it is real. But at that point, I was like, look, I will do whatever for money, you know, because if, if you're starving, you're going to have to try to find some way to make some money somehow, you know, and you need to get your car out of car jail and things like that. So I just typed into Google just psychic hotlines and I just clicked on the very first one that came up, scrolled all the way to the bottom, found the link to actually join as a psychic to my surprise. I thought this was just going to be some foolish thing that I was pursuing, right? Like I didn't, I didn't think it would actually amount to anything. Hi Krista, good to see you. And then I got the email just a couple days later that they actually hired me. And I was like, holy crap, this is awesome. Like, this is just getting real. And all I had was my Mythic Tarot deck. And all I had was this office, uh, this room, which is not a very big room. It's a very small room. It's just a guest room. Um, you know, it was just white walls. There was nothing here. It was just my computer, a beat up old TV stand that was had my monitor on it and my keyboard, my mouse, and my my tarot cards, and I literally sat on the floor. And after, when I f first got on the hotlines, I actually made like 20 bucks within the first couple hours. So that was considerably more than what I had made doing anything else working from home. And it literally cost me nothing because I was already paying for electricity, I was already paying, it was already included, right, in the utilities of just living there. So it literally was like magic. It was creating money literally out of thin air. Um, and I thought to myself, I was like, wow, I'm really on to something here. This is amazing. And I was like, okay, well, maybe it's just a fluke. So I decided to log in the next day. The next day, I made like 40 bucks in a couple hours. And then by the end of that week, I was actually able to buy us groceries. I was able to buy us food. I was able to start paying down some of these bills. Over the course of 2012 to about 2014, 2015, I think I stopped working on the lines. No, it was later than that. It was 2016 when I stopped working on them like four days a week. So 2012 to 2016, that's four years and four years I was able to dig us out of debt. I was able to um, buy a brand new car. I got my old car out of jail. I turned around and put that in for a trade to get, you know, the, the new car at a discounted cost. Um, I paid off all my credit card bills. I have less than $2,000 in student loan debt when I originally had about 12. And um, my house is completely paid off. I don't have a mortgage or anything like that. And I just turned 30 this year. So. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible what's going on. But here's the thing is this is completely possible for you. But here's the thing is that you have to actually want to commit to it. So it's like if you're not that uncomfortable with where you are and you're you're doing OK, chances are you're probably not going to have great results. But if you are motivated like I was, if you are on the brink of starving or you're on the brink of like losing your home or your house or things like that, and you actually have a reason to want to show up and work every day, then this is totally possible for you. You can do this. You can absolutely do this. And it's just, it's so much fun. It's so much fun to do this. And I didn't realize that this was going to be my calling until I actually started doing it. And then I realized just how much I actually love doing tarot readings and how actually good at it I am. I didn't even, you know, when I first got on the psychic hotlines, I didn't know how many cards were in a tarot deck. I didn't know the difference between the major arcana and the minor arcana. I was reading purely intuitively, purely from an intuitive place. And for whatever reason, people actually resonated with what I had said. Now, mind you, I do have a background in sales. I am a type of person that I can listen very easily. And I do like to give advice because when I was doing hair, 
basically when you do hair, you're like a surrogate psychologist. People just love to tell you. Uh, let me know in the comment section if you are the type of person that people just literally walk up to you and they tell you their whole life story and they want your advice. Like that would happen to me endlessly all the time. And I didn't have a word to describe it back then, but we call it like being empathic now. And that's like the new buzzword that everybody's using is empathic. But I've always been that type of person where people can just come up to me and just start talking to me, right? Rachel says, which is awesome, yay for intuitive. Yeah, and <laughs> Catherine says, hi everybody. Hi Catherine, good to see you. Lol says, yep, that's me. Rachel says, pretty much. Summer says, that's me. So if you already have that quality about you, then you're going to do even more awesome than everybody else. Rachel says, pretty sure Emily had an experience with that today. Oh yeah, with her post about the bank teller, like trying to ask her all about her life and stuff like that. Brandy says, yep. Lynn says, that has been happening to me since I was a teen. I've heard it every life story. I believe that about you, Lynn. <laughs> yeah. Krista says, me, all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of went in reverse when it comes to my whole, like, spiritual awakening and coming out of the broom closet and things like that. So, a little bit about my backstory. I kind of want to talk about how I came to the craft. So, we're going to talk about little, little me here for a little while. But that's basically, in a nutshell, how I came to work on the psychic hotlines. And then, around 2016, I started getting into, like, uh, life coaching. I, in 2014, I put some courses together. And then it was in the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, that I went full time into business coaching, psychic business coaching, and teaching other people how to actually do this and change their lives and get themselves out of the poverty that they were in. Because I, I understand, I mean, as self-made people that don't come from money or don't have a lot of opportunity in life, like I, I didn't have that. So everything I have is by the grace of God and due to my own hard work, you know, and I think that's the majority of people that we actually have in this group. And I think you can really relate to that part of my story, right? Okay, tea break. All right. Everyone in the bus for some reason. <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Okay, so... When I started doing my spiritual awakening, I was, how old was I? That was 2011. We're in 2018 now. That was seven years ago. So I was 23. And I actually have a couple clients um, who are in the 22, 23 range. And I can see that whole thing. I, it's really interesting, um, you know, watching your clients unfold in these same exact sequences that you did back then. It's just super interesting. I'm really humbled by it. But I do have a couple clients that are in their early 20s and they're starting to have these spiritual experiences, right? It's just really, really interesting. So when I, where I grew up, I actually grew up um, I was very, very lucky. I grew up in a household that was very open to psychic abilities, was very open to what we now call woo-woo. But when I was growing up, we didn't actually label it or define it. I just knew that we weren't like everybody else, if that makes sense. Like all of my friends went, I had a lot of Catholic friends. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends that are always trying to get me to go to church with them on Sunday. And I remember being like five or six years old and um, wondering, asking my mom, like, why don't we go to church on Sunday? And my mom didn't really have a good answer for me. And I didn't really... I, all I knew is that we were different. I didn't know how we were different, but I just knew we were different. Later now, I know that, um, what, I guess I came from an alternative household is maybe the best way to describe it. Um, spiritually open, open-minded. And uh, I remember being like maybe five or six when my mom first got me started on doing some divination. My mom had always been a dabbler. She had always been um, interested in witchcraft and Wicca and divination and tarot cards and things. But she she didn't really commit to a practice. Uh, it was always just dabbling, right? And it was always just for fun, for entertainment, just something to do, to bond together. And she got me started on a pendulum when I was about six years old. I remember very clearly it was like a long gold chain and it had a um, an emerald colored stone in it and I remember going and finding it in her medicine cabinet you remember 
if you grew up with mothers around, you know, if you had that luxury, then you probably remember going through your mother's um, medicine cabinets and her jewelry boxes and all of her drawers hidden in her bedroom, you know, how we love to do as little girls. And I remember finding this pendulum and not knowing what it was. So I asked her what it was and she showed me, she said, well, this is how we, um, this is how we predict whether a baby's going to be a girl or a boy. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, th she's trying to tell me in terms that a six year old can understand. And she asked me if I wanted, uh, the pendulum. And I said, yes, of course. And so I took it and it's somewhere. My mother still has it, but, um, you know, I, I had it and I would use it. And she told me that also you could do yes or no questions with it. And I thought it was just the coolest thing in the world. And I took it to school and I remember, um, one of the, one of my friends being like, oh, that's interesting. And they're like telling people their mothers and their fathers and stuff. And then that's where I realized that I really shouldn't be taking these things to school because I started getting some of my friends, they weren't allowed to hang out with me anymore. So that, that was my first clue that, um, you know, we were really, really different. Um, we didn't go to church and I was bringing divination tools to school and other parents had a problem with that. And apparently there was a conversation that went on parent teacher conference and we're not allowed to bring those things anymore. So anyways, that was that. <clears throat> and that was just, you know, the first of many experiences that I had. And so I, at that point, I kind of rescinded. I kind of came into myself and started looking towards myself as my main source of entertainment, especially as being an only child. It was very difficult for me to make friends and to have people around me that were interested in the same things I was, you know. As long as we were playing Barbies, we were fine. But after that, it was very difficult for me to actually connect with people because there was this, there was a stigma about me being different. Even my own family members and cousins were kind of like, they, they didn't really invite me along to go on family things and things like that. Like sometimes they did, but it was just a weird dynamic. It was just a weird thing. And you know how kids are, like they pick up on this weirdness and they don't understand it. And that was me for a long time. I didn't, I didn't understand. Like I thought something was actually wrong with me. Um, we didn't use words like witch. We didn't use words like witchcraft. Like that was not even really in my vocabulary. And honestly, when I f first heard of what witches were or had my first introduction to witches, it was through pop culture. It was through movies like Hocus Pocus and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And um, there's so many other different shows that I grew up on. Oh my gosh, what's the one with the little, she has short red hair and she's a witch and she has a little black cat that follows her around. It's a cartoon. I can't remember what it's called, but these are some of the shows that I grew up on, right? And so I started through pop culture, I started actually identifying through the with the witch archetype through pop culture because I, Matilda, thank you, because I realized that they had very similar lives that I did. They were alone most of the time, they had trouble making friends, they were called different, they were weird, they were not like normal people. And even at such a young age, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, I was already intuitively picking up on, on this stuff around me. Kiki's, it was, Matilda's a good one. I like, I liked that movie too, but Kiki is, is actually what I was thinking about. It was like based off of an anime. Moana, yeah, the vampire. Summer says, I've always said, had the same thing. I felt different and I grew up in mostly a Mormon state, which is even more difficult. <clears throat> Krista says, I've noticed a lot of people who are intuitive or psychic have that lifelong struggle of being, feeling like we don't belong, feeling we're outside the group. Absolutely. It's completely true. Um, and in most cases, of course, there's always exceptions to that. And some people grow up in magical families and hopefully more kids now will grow up in open-minded communities and families versus back when most of us grew up and even before pop culture, I consider myself even more lucky because I had pop culture. You know, I had icons on TV to kind of keep me company. Whereas people who are 40 and on up at this point, they didn't really have that. Maybe they had a little bit of bewitched and things like that, but that was more of an adult show. There really wasn't this pop culture of, you know, teenagers 
going through these these sort of things that were relatable to kids at such a young age. Rachel says, I grew up with Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't mind me, I'm just scrying the carpet as the elders are talking. That is so you. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, so I had these, I had these ideas of what a witch kind of was and, but it was very fantastical, right? It was very magical. It was very, um, not what witchcraft really is, uh, the real version of witchcraft today, uh, in, in general, but it was very much, you know, like things magically appear and teleporting and all of these fantastical abilities that we all wish we had. Um, but that was like my first indoctrination into it. Um, and then when I was about 10 or 11, it was 1999, I remember what the year was, um, 1999, I was, I think I was 12, 11, no, how old was I? That was nine years ago, 19 years ago. Okay, so I was 11, yeah, 11. Okay, so <laughs> math is not my strong point. <laughs> Okay, so I was about 11. Me and my cousin were shopping together. We, My mom dropped us off at this um, bookstore. And somehow uh, we ended up splitting. And she was going looking at something and I was going and looking at something else. And somehow I found myself in the metaphysical section of the bookstore. I don't know how. Like I'm telling you, like there are these weird, ex like these weird experiences that I have. And like there's just... There's, I truly feel there was something guiding me to these experiences that I could not have guided myself. I didn't go into the bookstore looking for the metaphysical section. I just somehow wound up in it. And as I'm looking through each of these books, says the tax, tax expert, okay, if I have a calculator, I can do it. But in my head, <laughs> if I have a calculator. So I'm looking through these books and I'm seeing all of these really complex topics, you know, like I found the satanic Bible and I opened that and I looked at that for a minute and I was looking at that and I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. Um, and then I looked at some other books and things like that. And then I found the Holy Grail that changed my life forever. How many of you had this book growing up? It's called Teen Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. This came out as a direct result of the pop culture of witches coming out, okay? So just let me let me frame this. Silver Ravenwolf is like the Doreen Virtue of witchcraft. She's the fluffy bunny of witchcraft. But she was the only one who actually had a book out specifically for teenagers and Wicca slash witchcraft. At that point, I didn't understand there was a difference between being a witch and being a Wiccan. It was one of my books I had to throw away. You're not alone. I'll tell you why in here in just a moment. Tammy says, wasn't allowed to share about having imaginary friends and thoughts and the future stuff. Yeah. And so I think that a nervous breakdown manifested at the age of 23. Now, 25 later, years later, I'm free to express freely. Isn't it weird how we all kind of have that, like, at 22, 23... That's where our world just kind of does a 180 and everything kind of changes and we start spiritually waking up. Anyways, so I found this book and I asked my mom if I could buy it. Uh, she came to pick us up and she's like, yeah, not a problem. So my cousin, who uh, we always did everything together. We were like twins, sort of. Um, she lived in Las Vegas and I lived in Lake Havasu and it was about a two and a half hour drive away. And so... I would, we would go up to Vegas and they would come down here every so often. So every so often I would get to hang out with her. And every time we go, we went anywhere, we'd always have to get the same of everything. So if we got shoes, it had to be the same. If we had ice cream, it had to be the same. We were that kind of annoying, those annoying kids, right? Susie says, I can relate to that. I recently had a lunch with my sixth grade teacher. Wow, that's pretty crazy. And we were talking about how we celebrated Guy Fox Day. And she said that I was always the first one to throw the effigy in the bonfire. So a rebel from the beginning. Lal says, when I was 12, I went to the library. I never had, I never really read before. I picked up the first book that caught my eye and it was Wicca by Kate Tiernan. I still read them at 25. Yes. 
Krista says, Silver was my favorite. Her three books, How to Ride a Broomstick, Stir Magic Cauldron, To Light a Sacred Flame, I have all of those. Those are all very good books. All of them were got you started. I've read them so many times. Most of the writing is worn off in the covers. Mine too. I mean, there's holes in this book. There there are notes all around it. And, uh, you know, the cover is kind of, here's my cute little 11-year-old me little signature that I made. Mainville is my maiden name. Um, so I found, yeah, I found this book. And um, I asked my mother if I could buy it. She said, sure. She bought it for my cousin as well. My cousin goes back to um, Las Vegas, and her mother sees it, and apparently um, her mother, this is allegedly, excuse me, this is the story, um, allegedly she, her mother brought it to church to ask the priest if this was okay for her daughter to read, and the priest said no and recommended burning it, and so... <laughs> Um, my cousin had to burn her book, and it was really sad because we, um, we we did we wrote each other letters like pen pals, you know, and we would write each other like we'd be doing like, making up new spells and asking each other, did you try this spell yet on page whatever? How did it go? Um, what did you think about this? And so we would be talking to each other, and that was my first real experience with being able to communicate with someone about these sort of things. And she told me like a month later, a month or two later, that her mother, she wrote me and said that her mother um, actually made her burn the book. And I was, I was devastated. I was truly devastated because I felt like, again, it was another one of those rejections where um, just for talking about what I was interested in was a bad thing, you know, and my mother, God bless her heart, she tried to explain to me that it's okay and that it doesn't mean that she doesn't love me and blah, blah, blah. But at the time, I definitely took it to heart and I uh, stopped, I just altogether stopped talking to that person. Rachel says, I know how that feels. Yeah, so this is my first introduction. And then at that point, I became what is called a solitary witch. So after years and years of, of, trying to connect with other people and talk to other kids about this, these sort of things and constantly getting rejected by it uh, and being called weird and things like that. Like, uh, so many things. Like, I finally just started reading the book for myself and that was probably one of the best things I ever did because I stopped looking on the outside for validation. I start looking on the inside about, like, what are my own thoughts about it, you know? And that's when I really started journaling, and that's when I started doing these spells and experiments. Like, some of the first spells I ever did were, I know I did, there's one in here, if you have this book, what did I do with it? Um, it's the, it's the rain spell. The gentle rain spell on page 222, angel number of all numbers, um, 222. It's called the gentle rain spell. I did this. So I lived in the middle of um, the desert in Arizona, where it doesn't rain very much. And so one of the first spells I ever did was a rain spell and it involved a bowl of water. You had to say the incantation over it and you had to collect these obscure ingredients and things like that. And I just remember it was so much fun because it was like going on a treasure hunt. It was like going on, uh, it was like a, a quest. I needed something in my life like that. I needed a quest like that. And I remember doing that spell on a Friday night and I remember I walked home from school every single day. Monday through Friday when I was in junior high and in high school and I remember that Monday it started raining and on my way home um well to where I was walking I would walk pretty much everywhere after school and I remember looking up I remember very distinctly remembering telling myself I said Christina remember this moment and I remember looking up at the clouds and thinking wow I wonder if I actually had a hand in this and I intuitively felt that I did. I intuitively felt that it was because of the spell that I had done that it was raining. And that day was really life-changing for me because I realized, oh my gosh, you know, this stuff is real. And it does work. And I thought it was really cool. It doesn't matter if it was it rained because it was that was already forecasted. You know, I was 11, 12 years old. I didn't know. But it was life-changing in the fact that I thought to myself for once that I actually had control over my life. And that's something that we're really going to focus on this week is all about how witchcraft and being a witch is more about taking control of your life 
rather than any sort of label or anything like that. Barbara says, the only ones that I, that know I do spells are my kids. I had to teach them to stay away from the altar. They're all grown with their own kids now, doing their own spells. That's so sweet. And then I remember going through this book, and, you know, and there's even ones in here that were, like, to get even with bullies and things like that. And so, you know, like, I just, I went through the book. I did so many spells. I did healing spells. And the crazy thing was is that all of the spells worked. <laughs> they all worked. Maybe they didn't work exactly how I thought they were going to work, but every single one of them worked. And I was just, like, blown away by this. And so I asked my mom, um, I can't remember how I found out about tarot cards. Maybe it was the Miss Cleo commercials. Or maybe tarot's in here somewhere. But I remember being very, very interested in tarot cards and asking my mother, will you buy me some tarot cards? And she said, I will buy you tarot cards if you read this book from front to cover. Because she didn't, you know how parents are. They don't want to buy you things that you're not going to use and you think it's just a phase and collect dust and things like that. My mother was a very hardworking single mother. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on trivial things like books about witchcraft and tarot cards and things like that. So she wanted to make sure that I was actually interested in this stuff and not just, you know, going to ask for it and then just let it sit there. What's your book called again before we move? Oh, this is called Teen Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. She has many, many books out. She's actually doing granny magic now. She's getting back to her powwow roots. And I love keeping... She's actually online. Uh, you can keep up with her online. Her name is Silver Ravenwolf. Yes, you're welcome. Marissa says, I read Black Arts by Richard Cavendish when I was 12. It turned out to have stuff about numerology and stuff like that. Yeah, so it is a portal. Um, you know, it is a portal to some other things. Is it a portal to evil? Absolutely not. What it was for me was a portal to being in control of my life, deciding that I am powerful and that I do have power. And in the beginning, sure, it was a 12, 11-year-old, 12-year-old ego trip. Sure, it was like that. But it's just, it's so much more than that now that I'm an adult. And in retrospect, I have no regrets at all about this life path that I've gone down. And so um, I read the book. And so for my 12th birthday, she, or for not my birthday, Christmas. For Christmas, she actually got me my first deck of tarot cards, which was the Mythic Tarot. And we had a lot of fun. We would do readings for each other and it'd be totally intuitive. We didn't know what, you know. I remember looking at the book that came with it thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea. And there would be like, you know, 10 different interpretations for one card. And it's like, how do you know which interpretation is which? And at that point, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> Susie so says she's doing granny magic now. She is. She's doing granny magic now. She's doing poppets and things like that. It's really fun. Go check her out. She's got a shop. She sells candles and things like that. So if you would like to support uh, one of our founding authors, you know, for the new pop culture wave of, of, of Wicca, I definitely recommend following her and contributing to her shop. So I got tarot cards, and then the next year for Christmas, I got Ouija, I got a Ouija board. Um that was my own and I also grew up my grandmother was a spiritualist uh, medium she would do mediumship parties and I remember being very young and, and peeking out of my bedroom and kind of watching these things going on that I wasn't really allowed to to be involved with necessarily but um, I was uh, witness to so it was very very interesting and then when I met my husband um, you know when I got into high school I kind of put these things away I I still was interested in things, but I had one really bad experience. I was in, It was my last year of junior high, 8th grade. I was invited to a party, my best friend Jennifer. Um, I hope she forgives me for what happened, but um, you know, at the time I didn't know. I didn't know any better. And her grandmother had recently passed, and I talked about this story before in, in one live stream. But I, uh, and we went to her party. It was like what her sweet 16 or something like that. And her grandmother showed up in the room, like, as full body apparition sitting in the corner staring at me. And I had never had a spirit, um, I would never had a spirit manifest like that to me. Like, I'm clairaudient, I know what clairaudient is now, but previously, um, I just, I heard ghosts, like, I would hear them talking or whispering, I would hear people... Um, saying my name, especially as I'm like going to sleep, I, I hear, it's, like, it's almost kind of like a crackling, whispering kind of sound. I hear that still as an adult, but 
it was my first experience, you know, seeing a live, um, ghost slash apparition in front of me. And it was at the most inconvenient time and, and place. And I couldn't get her to go away. And I tried to, um, ignore the spirit for a long time. Um, I tried to ignore it. and I, you know, I had already had this reputation, right? So I already had this reputation working against me as the weird girl, you know, the weird psychic girl that sees spirits or something. And, uh, so I, I couldn't ignore it any further. Um, you know, if you've ever had a very pesky pestering type of ghost around you, it can be very, um, it can be very distracting. And so I finally took, took my friend to her bedroom and I said, look, I mean, I don't want to have to tell you this, but you know, your grandmother's here. Um, she sh she's just here. I, d I don't know what she wants, but I see her and, um, she, my friend flipped out. I mean, she just freaked out. Um, it was not a good experience. I basically had to, um, she ran and told her mother, um, this was also a Catholic friend, uh, who had been trying to get me to go to church and things like that. And she, her mother basically berated me in front of everybody and, and kicked me out, called my mom, told me I was no longer allowed to hang out with her anymore. I couldn't come over to her house anymore. And I ruined her sweet 16 party and things like that, you know? And so after that point, um, moving into ninth grade, I just, I, I stopped because at that point it was costing me too much. It was costing me too many friends. It was costing me like, uh, my social life and things like that. Now we have these cool shows with Chip Coffee and it's like psychic kids. And then it's actually kind of cool to be the weird kid now, but back then it wasn't, it definitely wasn't cool. <laughs> Victoria says, ride the silver broomstick and books by Dorothy Morrison. Dorothy Morrison is a wonderful author. Chris says, does it ever sound like muffled and people are talking, but you can't quite hear them? Yeah. That's basically what it sounds like. Um, and then, you know, you, it's like a radio that's like not, it's what it sounds like is like a radio that's not quite in focus. Like you have to actually use your psychic abilities to kind of tune in and hear what's being said. And at most, sometimes I can just make out if it's male or female or a child or adult, but I have to, and I really just kind of, uh, tune that stuff out unless I'm working with the spirit directly. I have learned, uh, through psychic protection and psychic development, I have learned how to control those abilities, but back then, uh, it kept me up all night and I would see apparitions and I would see ghosts and, um, shadow people. And I would see animals, um, animals that we had that had passed. I would be seeing them. Um, you know, just, just lots of just basically uncontrolled. And then when you're in, when you're a teenager going through puberty, then you also have poltergeist activity. And I definitely had that too. I mean, like pictures would fall down, things would fly across the room. So not only, was I dealing with the actual spirit world, but then I also had my own psychokinesis abilities that were coming through puberty and just making everything really chaotic for a long time. Crystal says, yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. Well, says, I understand it's harsh as a child. It is. Crystal says, I'm sorry you went through that. I'm, uh, you know, I'm sorry for a 12 year old me, but I'm not sorry for 30 year old me, if that makes sense. Because Every single thing I've gone through in my life has been an experience, although hard, um, to make me a stronger individual. And I would definitely not be like nearly as, as successful as I am right now, just personally, um, in terms of managing my own emotions, managing my abilities, things like that. If I hadn't have gone through those experiences. Yeah. Catherine says, oh no, gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is what it is, right? Lola says, I find when I'm in danger, spirits shout at me. Interesting. Very interesting. Lola says, absolutely, it shapes us. It does. It shapes us. It absolutely does. So I ended up uh, putting that stuff away. Um, and in high school, I just uh, really, I, I decided that I really just wanted to get out of there. And I hated that place. And I just, I... I decided that where I was was not where I wanted to be. And I knew that there was more out there that I wanted to go see. I met my husband and I was actually, um, I was in the gifted program in high school and I was, uh, did three years of high school, graduated with not only in, I did the gifted program where it was the fast track acceleration program, where by the time I graduated, I did three years of 
in three years, I did four years of high school and one year of college in three years. Basically, my whole, I just thrust myself into school. Um, I would, I did summer school, uh, multiple classes of summer school. I was in class from uh, 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night going to, to the college campus, you know. Charlene says, the muffled radio thing has mostly gone away these days. Hi, Charlene. I love you. Thank goodness, except when I'm super tired. Yeah, because, like, when you're tired, you're, like, in that tween space, that twilight space. Victoria says, after you work with ghosts or spirits, do you ever get sick, tired, headaches? So, for me, personally, I only work with spirits on a very limited basis. Like, maybe I'll work with, maybe I'll take on two or three mediumship clients per year, and usually it is a Halloween offer that I do. Last year, I didn't even do any, because... For me, um, I know for sure that I'm not supposed to be a professional medium because for me, it takes up a lot of energy and I've, over the past like four years, I've really built up my psychic walls. I've built up my psychic protection now to where to actually connect with that other side on such a deep fundamental, like not fundamental, foundational level, like to really connect that much and to put my guard down. It actually takes more energy for me to put my wards down than it does, um, you know, doing tarot readings where I'm channeling, like, divine guidance type of thing. But when I am connecting with other spirits, yes, like, <sighs> like I'm. that's all I can do. Like That is all I can manage to do, and that's all my energy goes to that. So there are some people who can talk to spirits, and it's... It doesn't affect them as much if if it doesn't affect you it probably means that that's probably part of your life path but if it does take a lot of energy and it's something that I found the truth of it really is is in my opinion our body will tell us in subtle ways this is for me and this isn't for me and I find that if I'm like getting tired with certain types of clients or certain types of readings it's my with my body telling me that I don't really actually want to do that and that it's not, it's not the best use of my abilities. Yeah. <laughs> Charlene, she says, because people are exhausting. No joke. And when they're dead, dead people have no boundaries whatsoever. So p dead people don't sleep. So they will bug you every five seconds because they do not have, there's no sense of time. Like we have a sense of time. Time is linear for us as physical beings. On the other side, it's not linear. It's, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's no, there's not a sense of time. So, you know, five minutes could pass here on physical earth and they could be bugging you every five minutes for something or showing up or messing around. Like one thing that does happen to me all the time is if there is a spirit or entity, not just the spirit of a human, but the spirit of, it could be, um, a fairy, it could be an angel. It could be, usually fairies are the ones that, that do this to me. But it could be other types of entities, high vibrational entities, mind you. Not all entities are good entities to work with. But the high vibe ones, meaning that they're not going to, um, that they're not going to work for their own benefit, that have some sort of alliance to man. Okay. Hi, Janine. Oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. I love that you are here. Thank you for showing up. Catherine says, LOL. <laughs> Rachel says, Amen, Charlie. Amen. For real. Charlene says, and just because they're dead does not mean they are more evolved. Absolutely. Like, whenever I talk to my father that's on the other side, like, he's still just as dumb as he was. Like, he is, he, <laughs> it's just bizarre. Like, they're still just as they are themselves. You know, it's bizarre. Janine says, before connecting with the spirit, do you feel anxious somewhat? No, because I, I used to, but I don't now because my personal way, if you want to know how I actually do my mediumship readings, I cover this. There's the Give the Most Epic Tarot Readings for Halloween. It's a workshop that's in my school on Thinkific. If you're in the masterclass, you already get access to that because you get all tarot-related workshops for free. But if you are really seriously interested in learning how I do my mediumship readings in a way that, that feels good and safe and doesn't feel um, like scary, the non-scary form of mediumship, it's in that workshop. And the just the quick version of it is I actually now, instead of contacting them in my waking life, I invite them to instead come to my dreamscape. And I do astral traveling and I connect with them that way. 
because I find that when I'm asleep, I'm more open and I'm not as anxious. Yeah. That's interesting, Christina. Thank you. You're welcome. Lynn says, my father is dead and he is still mean-spirited. Yeah, isn't that bizarre? Rachel says, it's wonderful. Freaking watch it. Rosa says, yes, it's amazing. Rachel says, there's one for love readings, too. Yeah, there's that's that's a really good one, too. Susie says, this reading with Christina truly changed my reading. Awesome. I'm so glad. Janine says, great. Yeah, um, Janine, Janine's an old coaching client of mine. I... Janine, I'll just send it to you for free. So just um, just send me a reminder that you want that, and I will send it to you. Marissa says, it is absolutely brilliant to work within the dream like that. Yes, um, I think so too. It's just, it, it's so much more pure, if that makes sense. Rachel says, I do that too. Made my own astral cottage for mediumship with a simple open and closed sign. I love that. I have a clicker. Um, when I go like this, I'm on. When I go like that, I'm off, Okay. So this is how I tell the spirits. And I also have office hours, if that makes sense. Like from, you know, I, after I'm done working, like if there really is a spirit that really needs attention or something like that, or an entity of some sort or an angel or anything like that, you know, any type of high vibrational being, I said office hours, you can contact me from nine to six after six o'clock. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to see you. I, that is my time. That is my time. And really what it comes down to is just being very forceful and being very much about your boundaries and saying, I'm listening, I'm, this is what I'm listening, this is what I am not listening. Um, and that's the, been the best way for me to kind of work on controlling my mediumship abilities. I don't have very many, I don't have as much of a problem. Like before, when I was just like, I was just a, a walking antenna before, you know, I would just pick things up all the time. Um, and there was no filter or anything like that, but as you grow your psychic abilities, and I'm, I'm so looking forward to the psychic circle because, oh my gosh, we're going to have so much fun, but participating in psychic circles or mediumship development circles or psychic ability development circles, things like that, in a safe place with someone who is experienced is one of the best ways. So if you didn't have a chance to join the psychic circle, try to find another one out there. There's tons of them out there. Um, or get on the wait list just in case, you know, I open up a second one this year, but working on your psychic abilities month after month after month, going through these exercises, learning how to set up your wards and your guards, that has been for me probably the number one key to actually learning how to manage my psychic abilities. You need help. You need the help of someone else to do it. Mm. Awesome idea, Rachel. Yeah, it's a great idea the, to create a dreamscape place that you go to. Yeah. Mine is, um, it's a garden with a brook. Rachel says, I already love sharing it with my students. So excited to do our own psychic and energy development. Yay! We meet next week. Psychic in pajamas. We're going to have so much fun. We're going to play a game next week. We're going to do a meet and greet. Um, we're going to do a really fun personality test. It's going to be super fun. Rachel says, can't wait for the circle. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, and then getting back on track here, because we're already an hour in. Okay, so I ended up um, putting that stuff aside. I was actually getting ready to join the military, going to the army. I had lost um, a whole bunch of weight. I was in the female weightlifters league, and I was working out, like, seriously, hours every single day. Getting ready to pass my um, PT test for the army, getting ready to go to boot camp met my husband and all of that went to, <laughs> went out the window, met my husband, um, moved in like a couple months later, decided to move across the country, somehow went up in Missouri. And then, you know, from 2007 to until 2011, I was just living like a normal person. I, I tried to stuff everything down. Um, I pretty much put all of my books and things like my tarot cards. I put it I didn't bother taking it with me. I actually, my mom had to, has been so great. She's been sending me all of my things um, through packages, all of my old books and things like that. I had left it all behind. I stuffed it down, and for a while I forgot about it. I forgot, and I was detached from that magical side, and I ended up getting very depressed, even more depressed than I was. I ended up having suicidal thoughts. I had developed anxiety, I was putting on weight, I was not taking care of myself, 
I was working until I had stress fractures in my feet. Um, I just, I, I didn't take care of myself at all. And then when I finally got fired, you know, or laid off, fired slash laid off, same thing really. When I got laid off in uh, 2011 and I, I looked at myself and I looked at my life and I was looking for something, you know, just anything. I ended up joining an ashram. Um, I ended up doing a one year of yoga, um, joining an ashram, took a vow of poverty. That was a very interesting experience and uh, decided to do something different, to do something different, do something that was not your typical go through high school, graduate high school, go to college, get a job, buy a house, get credit card debt, you know, all of these things that are what are considered normal, the, the average thing to do. And uh, I think that's what being a witch is about. I think it's about th throwing up the middle finger to what average and normal is. Does it mean that we still aren't you know, obligated to certain things, like do we still need to provide our own shelter and our own means of transportation, and do we have to take out a credit card sometimes? Yes, but I think for me, being a witch is more about being self-sufficient, independent, not getting trapped into these things that we think that we have to do that society pushes on us. And the truth is that people are going to hate us for it. People are just, they're not going to understand, especially the people that are so far into the trap, so far into debt, so far into the emotional manipulation of their family, their friends, their church, and things like that, that they, even if they try to get out of it, they're almost resentful to people that consider themselves to be witches because they're, they're, they feel guilty about their own life decisions as well, and they feel like a resentment towards that as well. So in a lot of cases, what we pick up, the flack that we pick up, the judgment and things like that, it has so much more to do with the fear, of their own fear of being rejected from their own communities, and not so much the fear of us, if that makes sense. Which there is that fear too. I mean, they'll try to say anything. They'll say witches eat babies. They'll say that we curse people, they'll say that, you know, we're the reason why their crops aren't growing, things like that. All of those things that we have, you know, people that the church has perpetuated over the past five, six hundred years with the, you know, the witchcraft trials and things like that, the persecution, and it has always been against the self-sufficient, uh, independent, specifically women, who did not define themselves by marriage, did not define themselves by how many children they had, to not define themselves by um, their house or you know their their belongings and their church and their family their family and things like that. Charlene says nom nom noms. <laughs> Rachel says witches are rebels and that's scary. It is scary. It's scary because rebels are what we call witches are really chaotic neutral. If you want to get down to it, um, you know it's like. You never, you never really know what a witch is going to do, whether she's going to try to get even or, or not, and it can be scary, and the type of witch that you are really has more to do with your personality than any type of label or any type of craft or any type of theology can really, um, you know, place upon you, because there are, I've, I've known some really wonderful Christian people, I have Christian friends, they're, they're wonderful people, very open-minded, would never judge me, and but they are secure in their beliefs because they're good people, and I think that's the distinction to make. But I've also known some really evil Christians. I've really known I've known some evil Muslims. I've known some evil Jewish people who use their, um, you know, their beliefs as a way to put blame on other people who don't follow that status quo. And it's just a it's a terrible thing that happens. But that's why it's so important. For us to come out of the broom closet because in numbers we have strength and if there are more of us every single day then it becomes less uh easy to perpetuate these beliefs about us it becomes less easy to persecute us to kill us to burn us to drown us to stone us it that's why we need people to come out of the closet and it's so important that you do and whatever baby step is manageable for you even if it means that you simply are claiming the word witch that you're claiming this lifestyle that you're saying it's 
doesn't matter what other people believe about me. All that matters is what I believe about myself. And that's pretty much the key, I think, to overcoming these stereotypes that are out there, especially with pop culture. I mean, pop culture is awesome. Um, it introduced me to so many different things, but pop culture can also be harmful as well. So we need more uh, female directors that are also witches or spiritually open-minded to come out with more movies and magazines and, and places, especially at groups like this, this group in particular, where I didn't have anybody to help me in the beginning. The first two years I did this by myself, I didn't meet my first business coach until 2014. So... Like, I had two whole years to my own self trying to figure all this stuff out by myself, trying to figure out what my beliefs are, managing my psychic abilities, learning how to make money with my psychic abilities, struggling with the thought that if I earn money from my psychic abilities, I'm somehow evil or, you know, I'm somehow, like, unspiritual or unpure because I equate giving services in exchange for money as something that is actually spiritual. And I kind of floundered around and I, it, it sucked. It, I, basically it sucked and I just didn't get anywhere. My business didn't get anywhere. I was working so much and I was just on the hotlines all the time. And if you've been on the hotlines, you know that the hotlines are awesome at making money, but really the hotlines, there's a limit because people can be very, very draining on them too. Nobody wants to work on the hotlines as their like number one career for the rest of their life because there is a limit to helping people on there. And if you're someone who really does want to help people in like really transformational ways, then the hotlines is something that is kind of like a bridge between where you are now, which is probably not making a lot of money, and where you ultimately want to be, which is calling in these higher income levels and charging these higher prices that attract these more committed type of clients, you know? Lynn says, Raymond Buckland became famous. That is the difference between a male witches and female witches. Yeah, I was so sad to hear of his passing. He just passed last year. It was terrible. I have many Raymond Buckland books. Um, and, you know, uh, Raymond Buckland uh, was not... Let me, let's get this straight, too. Becoming a witch does not automatically make you right or somehow holy, holier than other people, okay? Just because you can see the veil of illusion, just because you can see these, these other patterns and these traps and these other energies out there, doesn't mean that you are necessarily, again, like a, a good person um, or that you don't have antiquated types of beliefs. Raymond Buckland was uh, a treasure to the movement, but he did have some of these older, um, more traditionalist, patriarchal types of beliefs. Um, and it was not so much self-evident through his writing, but really evident through his day-to-day -day actions. Does that make sense? It's kind of like the whole Aleister Crowley debate, though I'm not saying Buckland was anything like Crowley at all. He wasn't. But what I'm trying to say is everybody has that certain side to him, and just be, just claiming the word witch doesn't automatically make you a good person. So let's get that straight right away, too. He did. Mm -hmm. Leonie says, still struggle with that. Yeah. Lynn says he had a very naughty side. He did. Rachel says, it wasn't until I came out to my family, wrote my post, and talked to Karen about my broom closet experience that I started coming into my spiritual butterfly wings. It was finally releasing to say, to, it was releasing to finally say it. That's so, touches my heart. Rachel says, that's my problem with reading his books. It's hard to like it. Rachel says, Crowley was a trip. Yeah. Right. Marissa says, Crowley was brilliant, but very creepy. Yes. Agreed. 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 So, um, you know, just also be mindful of the types of books that you pick up and the theologies that you get into. We're going to talk about this later in the week as well. Specifically, the difference between being a witch and, and being a Wiccan or specifically the difference between witchcraft as a practice and witchcraft as a religion. We're going to touch on that, that sort of stuff. So you're probably wondering, OK, how many of you actually identify as a witch? Give me a show of hands, comment which, or just give me a heart or anything like that. Um, if you are struggling with claiming the word which, go ahead and just type in struggling and just let me know where everybody's at with that because I'm really curious how many people that we have that actually identify as a witch and how many that are still kind of struggling with the word which and actually claiming that for themselves. 
Rachel's raising her hands. Charlene's a witch. Lynn's a witch. Very good. Awesome. Brandy's a witch. Krista's a wicked witch here. Okay, very good. Very good. My hair is not cooperating today. Okay. Summer, you still kind of struggle. I'm interested. Um, I want to hear why you struggle if you're open to sharing with that. If you want to go ahead and do like a new post and why you're struggling. Kristen, I am more of a medicine person. I struggle with which. Okay, interesting. Adrian's new. Janine says, not sure I feel I am, but struggling. Okay. Marissa says, shamanic practitioner. Okay. So, there are a bunch of different types of witch. And witch is really a word that, um, it's almost kind of like some derogatory words that maybe some gay people might have thrown at them that they're now reclaiming. There's a lot of different words that are were initially um, derogatory, but are now being claimed by those specific movements, by those specific groups of people as a term of empowerment. So if you have an aversion to the word witch, it is be not because you're not a witch or anything like that. It's because you are dealing with deconstructing, decompressing, processing through millennia of negativity associated with that word, subliminal messaging and marketing through the churches and, and things like that. So I don't identify as anything for no reason. <laughs> I feel like I've moved beyond that word. It, Ashley, yeah, we're going to talk about that later this week. I think I don't like labels, Summer says. Okay, perfectly acceptable. So whether you feel you're a witch or not, if you are specifically a woman who is self-sufficient, independent, goes against the grain, is not defined by a man or a marriage or a partner, whether you are gay, lesbian, however that works for you, uh, not defined by how many children you have, not defined by your social status or your church. Basically, you're a witch. And that's not a word that you give yourself. It's a word that other people give you. Because basically, you just go against the status quo. That's really all it is. A woman, specifically, that goes against the status quo. Men, yes. Men were also considered witches as well. But statistically, women were way more targeted than men were ever targeted doesn't mean that they weren't targeted. It just means that in most cases, a witch is a female person, a female identifying person. Oh, Leonie brings up another point. Yes, black people in witchcraft. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, you have that whole other connotation there as well um, from, you know, being considered a heathen or being considered into voodoo or, you know, all of these other pop culture stereotypes that are also thrown upon you just for being a person that has a different skin color in the world. It's terribly, it's terrible that that is even a thing. Rachel says, or if you happen to have a cat or a frog or a crow, yeah, on your property, if you had birthmarks on your body, they were considered, you know, little holes where Satan would penetrate you and shit like that. It's, it's bizarre. Some of these weird things that, that have, uh, identifying as a witch. If you grew your own herbs, if you didn't rely on the town doctor, if you were um, a wise woman, a medicine woman who could cure people, well, obviously, if you could cure people, then you could curse people too, right? Um, Janine says, we have eight cats. <laughs> yeah. So even if you were a medicine woman or a medicine man and you grow your own herbs and you were a midwife and you helped to the process of the cycle of life and death, you know, these types of things, if you did not conform to society, then you were considered a witch. And so now we've gone through this whole reclamation period, especially with the Renaissance in uh, the United States of America. The Renaissance, you know, was really getting away from the church in, in Europe as well. But in America, we've also gone through our own Renaissance as well. And that was around the early 1900s when we started getting... Uh, Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith and we started getting Aleister Crowley in the, the 20s, 30s and 40s and we started talking about um, the the era of science really and, and specifically occult science as well. So it's really just recent within the past like 125 years that we've really started 
using the word witch in a way that we are actually reclaiming that word for ourselves and saying, yes, we are witches. We are going against the status quo. We are an independent people, you know, heathen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm missing comments here. Rachel says, just got chewed out by someone the other day for saying heathen when it's literally a section of Azataru now. Oh, well, mm, yeah, there's that whole thing too. It's very hard. It's very difficult. Um, Rachel says, if you were an old lady who talked to another woman's kids, yeah, I mean, just so much. What do you consider the difference between a pagan and a witch? Okay, so pagan for me is usually has some sort of religious connotation, whether they're Nordic, whether they're um, Celtic, whether they're Greek, e Egyptian. It's basically pagan I associate with some sort of polytheistic um, religion. Charlene says, heathen versus as a true is debatable. It is still pretty fluid, flexible. And it's, it is, a, you know, it's, it's like I said, there are evil people, no matter what, no matter what religion, that will use um, a doctrine to further an agenda against a certain people. So it's not, it's not that as a true is like bad. It's just that there are certain people who cling to that to push their own evil agendas. Krista says pagan is more of an umbrella term. Yeah. Right. Pagan is, Rachel says pagan is nature, religion, witchcraft is a practice. Yeah. A pagan doesn't have to be a witch and vice versa. Exactly. It's kind of like that whole, you don't have to be a witch to be a Wiccan and you don't have to, but not all witches are Wiccan, but most of all Wiccans are witches, right? Charlene says pagan is a religion. Wicca is a religion, which is a practice. Yeah, pretty much pretty much. Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So we'll go into briefly here, just the different types of witches. There are, uh, what we call solitary witches and there are what we call, um, covens and things like that. So solitary witches are people that are ba basically on their own. They don't really, um, get together with people. They prefer their own solitude. They prefer to do their own magic and things like that. There are witches out there that actually do both, that they have a solitary practice, but they meet with their coven every full moon or new moon or, or, or something like that. But in most cases now, especially with the internet being as it is, it's very difficult to find a completely solitary witch. Whereas, you know, before the internet and social media, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, it was more common for people to be solitary. And it was very difficult to actually find covens. Now you can find everybody online. Everybody's pretty much out in the open. But back then, pretty much solitary was the main form of being a witch. Charlene says, well, I mean, heathen as a religious path versus as true as a religious path. Right. Some practice heathenism as a subsect of as a true, but some practice it as its own thing. They are both in the Nordic family along with Odinism and Thorism. Yeah. Rachel says, I liked having a group gathering every month where it was Heather's group. I'm glad I can do that again with a psychic circle and start to do with my academy. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's basically the reason. I mean, Heather's taking a break. She's got her own, um, physical storefront now and she's just, she's doing her own awesome thing. And, um, so, you know, it's, we need the next person that's going to host that space because it's important. We don't want to lose that space. We don't want to lose that ability to connect with people. Someone's got to be that person to hold those spaces. It's very, very, very important that someone does, you know. So there's solitary. There's people that um, work with covens. There's, again, we're kind of hitting on a lot of this really important stuff. Some, some of people can be, some witches can be, polytheistic they can be religious meaning that they have like a pantheon that they work with basically if you're a polytheistic religious witch you you believe that there are um gods or goddesses or these other beings out there that are real basically you think that they're real um real in terms of they have their sentience does that make sense i mean everything is real and everything is not real at the same time that is the paradox but in terms of using the word real, I mean sentient, 
okay? Just just sentience. Like, instead of a, a thought form as a god, like I believe, like I'm, I am a non-secular witch, meaning I don't believe that there is, personally, I don't believe that, that gods and goddesses are their own thing out in the world. I don't believe they're sitting on Mount Olympus. I don't think there's a bearded man in the sky that's watching everything I do. You know, that sort of thing. I believe gods and goddesses in terms of more like archetypes, in terms of more like thought forms, in terms of more like spirit guides, and not necessarily like sentient beings. However, that's just me. There are, especially Wiccans, they tend to believe, you know, that the the, the goddess is, um, has its own sentience, the god has its own sentience, and that they are beings that are um, out there existing whether we believe in them or not type of thing. No problem, Leone. It's not a not a problem. It, you know, we all have our reasons. It's totally fine. Christian witches are a thing. Yes. So it, as many religions out there as there are, pretty much all of them have some sort of mysticism incorporated in them. There's Jewish mysticism, which is very much based on Kabbalah. Um, there are Christian witches. There are Gnostics, which are kind of like Catholic witches. Um, there are Nordic witches that believe in, you know, the Nordic pantheon. There's Greek pantheon. There's Egyptian pantheon. There's um, uh, Mayan pantheons. There's there's so many. So forever, how many religions there are out there, you will find witches in each and every one of them. So witches can be religious and also be a witch at the same time. Now, for Jewish peoples and for Christian peoples and for Muslim peoples. And atheist witches, yes, too, Charlene. Leonie says, I'm like you, Christina, believe spirit-wise. Yeah. <clears throat> Kimberly says, thank you for sharing that. Never heard it put that way, we sentience, but I feel the same. Yeah, um, you know, we're all going to come to our own beliefs, and it's totally cool to have whatever you believe. It's totally awesome to believe that. If it works for you and it makes you happy, that's all you can really ask out of uh, religion, right? It's just comfort and peace. Right. So um, but what you're going to find is that in the Abrahamic religion specifically and specifically in, in the book of Deuteronomy, um, you know, Kimberly, I think the word you're looking for is probably ag agnostic and not atheist. But there's agnostic, which is too that they don't know what they believe. They don't know if they believe that there is or isn't, you know, and they're just kind of on the fence about it. That's kind of like a, what an agnostic, which might be. Karen says, I'm a Druid witch. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so, I mean, there's so many different types of witches, whether they are secular or non-secular. Um, the only religions that I know of that really personally have, like, a really hard time assimilating the word witch and coming to terms with spiritualist kind of practices are the Abrahamic religions, where in the book of Deuteronomy, and you know, it says, thou not suffer a witch, and... Um, if any of you are casting stones or talking to spirits, what, or AKA necromancy, you know, that is basically forbidden in that religion. And it can be very, oh my gosh, it can be very difficult to grow up in a religion your entire life, but also be pulled towards these spiritual practices. And it's just like, cause you know, one, one part of you is saying, no, this is evil. This is bad. I shouldn't be doing this. I will not be in the favor of God if I do this and I will go to hell. And then we have this whole other part of us that are, we say, you know, but this feels good. This feels right for me. This feels like, this feels like it belongs in my life and I'm helping people. And it can be very hard to justify that. It can be very, very difficult. And I really feel for the Christian witches and, and the Jewish witches. Well, not so much the, well, there's different types of, uh, of Judaism, but mostly, it's mostly the Christian witches that really struggle with this the most you know it can be hard yeah thou shall not suffer a witch to live right victoria says latin witches with their god and goddesses yeah that too kimberly says yeah that feels better oh, okay about being agnostic rachel says i like the long name non-secular semi-solitary cottage witch with a touch of buddhism paganism Taoism, and as long as you're respectful for what you can do, you can mix. That's why I love witchcraft. It's a practice that's moldable. Yeah, it's a very flexible path. Um, you know, I work with so many pantheons myself. I work a lot with the Hindu pantheon, specifically 
Ganesh, work with Ganesh a lot. Um, I work a lot with the Greek pantheon as well. Um, you know, I've never really been one to kind of settle on a pantheon, though. Um, one part, one awesome part of being a witch, too, is looking into your ancestry and looking into where your ancestors are from, because you can also connect with your pantheon that way. Um, I'm a mutt, you know, I'm kind of a mixture of a whole bunch of, of different types of ethnicities. So if, for me, I don't really identify with a specific pantheon. I think that's just my dharma for being who I am. That's what I've incarnated into. But if you have a very specific ethnicity or you are a mixed person that comes from multiple ethnicities, it's totally okay. Like, I know lots of um, half black, half uh, Spanish people who do a, a form of hoodoo where it's like based on Catholicism, but it's also based on um, the, the Orishas and things like that. And it's like this beautiful medley fusion. Witchcraft is a fusion. It can be as traditional as you want it to be, but it can also be as inspirational as you want it to be, too. Yeah. Rachel says, me too. Lakshmi is on my goddess altar. I love Lakshmi. Charlene says, but Catholicism is so full of rich rituals. It is. It really is. I mean, <laughs> let's just be honest here. Victoria says, plural religion. Yeah. So you don't have to necessarily be religious to be a witch. So that can be kind of a relief for some of you as well. And you can be whatever religion that you want to be, and you can be a witch also at the same time. I know it's like, there's just so much freedom in being a witch, and that's what being a witch is, is it's freedom, it's liberation. It's the ability to choose for ourselves and to think for ourselves. The bottom, bare bones, you know, bottom line of being a witch is freedom, it's liberation. Yeah, so there's secular, non-secular, there's, um, what, the, I think the word that we're looking for is called eclectic. I tend to be an eclectic witch, which is basically, you know, it's like bits and pieces kind of pulled from different religions and magical systems and, um, spiritual practices, but done so in a respectful way, you know, we don't want to, like, culturally appropriate, appropriate some, uh, a religion or belief, unless we're being 100% respectful towards that. So, it's, hi, Lily! Hi, Lily! <laughs> a little witch in the making. Charlene says, we used to use the term ex eccentric to describe not adhering to any one faith path. Yeah, yeah. Eccentric, eclectic, yeah. <laughs> there's Christian, um, there's Celtic, there's Greek, there's Nordic, there's so many. Um, as long as you are approaching your practice in a respectful way, I don't see a problem. You know, like I don't, I don't feel like it's wrong to be interested in certain different cultures and religions and practices and magical traditions that are outside of your, your own culture and blood, which leads me to the next type of subjects. We have people that are what we call new witches, like they're new breeds, like they're, they maybe come from a family of the, a long line of Christian people that are the first in their family to awaken to these illusions, this, this veil that we have in front of us. Um, and that can be very difficult for them as well because they are choosing, you know, they chose to incarnate into a very tough life in the beginning, but they're, they're, they're the leaders. They're the forefronts. They're the people that are out there creating the new ways of being. They're out there challenging the status quo. They're out there challenging society. And then we have what we call blood witches or hereditary witches where, they come from a family of magical people, um, whether they were born into a, a magical religion or they were just born into a family kind of like mine where, you know, I had a medium for a grandmother. My mother was a dabbler in the occult. My, um, I have, it goes back. I have grandmothers who were cardomancers on both sides. And it's, you know, there's a lot of magical people in my family. This is what we call a blood witch or a hereditary witch. It's, it's a natural witch. We have new witches and we have natural witches. And in most cases, new witches, in most cases, secretly have ancestors that did practice witchcraft, but they did it in such a secretive way that they didn't tell the family about it. And it's not until like years later after people die that, that the elders of a family will come forward and say, you know, your aunt was into card reading for a little bit or something. You know, usually new witches ultimately will find in their life at some point that some ancestor of theirs 
actually was interested in witchcraft or interested in divination or interested in occult sciences. That's been my personal experience just like working with people. It's not definitely all people are going to have that experience. Some people literally are the first pioneer in their family. Yeah. Ah, oh, yes, that was meant to be eclectic. <laughs> Eccentric works too, though, Charlene. <laughs> Charlene's third generation. Yeah, I'm third. I'm third generation that I know about. Possibly more. Probably more. And most of you are also second, third, fourth, fifth generation um, witches that you just don't even know that. You just don't know. Because it was such a taboo that it wasn't talked about. Santoria, that's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying to say. Thank you, Leonie. Romani. Lynn's Romani. Yes, the Romani's. Rachel says, my mother would probably be a kitchen green witch if she admitted it. Mm -hmm. Catherine says, yeah, I just go with what feels right. Good. That's what you should do. Follow your heart. Charlene says, feelings are the best way to do it. Yes. Leonie says, the Orishas, the Santeria, and Christian. Yes. So we have this, we have this uh, fusion, and it's just a beautiful because if you haven't noticed, the world is getting more and more diverse every single day. You know, cultural boundaries are beginning to be dropped. Yes, we have a movement. There's always going to be evil people in the world who are always going to try to push their agenda to, to um, you know, div uh, be divisive and to keep us away from one another and to keep cultures pure, whatever that means. But I think if you can open your eyes and you can look around, the world is going to be a moving forward, you know, we're not going to have as moving forward in, the, in, at least in the United States, I was just reading about this, that if by the year 2040, white people in America will be, will be the minority, will be less than 40% of the total makeup. So it's like, we have to get on board with this right now. We have to start embracing cultural diversity. We have to start embracing fusion and we have to be more open-minded if we are going to survive as a people on this planet because this is the way that it is going this is the way it has always been going from day one from day one when our ancestors walked out of africa and started mating with the other neanderthals and started we started getting these mixed breeds and things like that from day one the universe wants us to to join in and be culturally diverse the universe wants us to share these things and i think for a lot of people who are in these old traditions and these old kind of secular beliefs that separation is the best idea. I think that being a witch is probably, you know, there's a couple forms to it tomorrow. We're going to talk a little bit about feminism and the role of feminism in witchcraft. But it's just one of those things where there's a lot of uh, old beliefs in the world still that are anti-female, anti-woman, and anti-cultural diversity. And being a witch is breaking down those barriers and saying, no, I don't agree with that. That's not right. It's, it's not okay to have those beliefs about people. And I, I think it's an amazing thing. And I, we are, again, this has only been like 120 years that this has really been in, in action, this, this whole belief, this whole movement. So we are still yet pioneers in this day and age. Marissa says, Benabel Wen is a tarot writer whose mom is a Taoist folk magician. She critiqued Benabel's spells when she got into Wicca. <laughs> That sounds about right. <laughs> For what I know of um, Asian mothers, that sounds about right. <laughs> okay, so I think that's all I really wanted to say today. There's a lot of witches, types of witches out there. You can be any type of witch that you want to be. Um, how you feel about the word witch is not as important as what you do in the world as a witch, okay? So in terms of prizes, I am going to be looking at everybody's journal prompts and things like that that they're posting in the group. I would love for you to participate and actually win some prizes. It's just it's just a way for me to give back to the community because I get so much out of this. I get so much from you guys. Um, you know, it's just awesome. I love giving back to the community. So I'm going to be giving away two 30 minute coaching sessions. 30 minutes. You'll get 30 minutes on the phone or on video with me. And we'll go over what's working for you, what's not working for you, where you want to be in the next three months. And we will actually sit down and create a strategy so that you can be more visible online. So part of coming out of the broom closet is, okay, you have to be visible. Not only do you have to be vis visible to make your business a success, 
But to really reclaim the word witch is, as Charlene said, gener three generations out and proud. So these two sessions, they're going to be 30 minutes on phone or video, and it's going to be awarded to the two people that put the most effort into this and put the mo reflect the most and really try to challenge their beliefs that they have around the word witch. Rachel says, screams internally. <laughs> Victoria says DNA tests are proving that there are very little pure blood people in the world. Yeah, it's just we have the science to back up these beliefs that we know are that we know are to be true that we are working on dismantling in the world. And the only reason why those uh, other, you know, beliefs exist are to keep certain people out from power, which is crazy to me because <laughs> there's enough room for all of us here. There's enough room for everybody to be successful to for everybody to have what they want to have their own space you know and it's just crazy to me that people want to try to dominate other people and dominate what they believe and things like that it's crazy i even believe that you know even the most radical people still deserve their own space we're on an island where they can just bomb each other into oblivion and live out their whatever <laughs> their religious beliefs as long as they're not harming other people and they're only doing it to themselves you know i'm very liberal in that way but anyways um, just don't do it on, around me and don't influence my life by it, you know. So I'll be giving out two 30-minute sessions. I'm also going to be giving out a mug, a Do Magic mug. This can be coffee or tea. And these are the big ones, okay. Do I have another coffee cup? I don't. But most coffee cups are like that big or like half size. This is a two cup size. And then I think I will also be doing some other like little grab bag types of prizes and then um, I'm also thinking we'll do a thing again where we did with the 500 members where we're, I'm going to give out some trainings and things like that, like some of the workshops or maybe even some of the video trainings that I have on hand that I can also give out. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we're going to have a really great week together. And then tomorrow we're going to be talking about a um, little bit more about what does it mean to be a witch? Um, what does it mean to be a feminist? And what is feminism's role in witchcraft? how witch, uh, witches do business differently than our muggle counterparts, why the freedom of expression is important to your ability to create and just create in the world, not only creating money, but creating the life that you really want. We're going to talk about how your uniqueness is the source of your power. And we're going to talk a little bit about attraction marketing in terms. Um, there was a really great thread that was out in the, po in the um, event page. There was a really great thread that was started and it was basically um, a bunch of our ladies in here. They were picking on themselves. They were, you know, some people were saying their voice is too high and squeaky or their voices was too low and it sounds like a man. And some people were, you know, going on about how they don't have the right background so they can't do live streams and they can't talk to people. And, or, you know, the, all of these things that we put on ourselves. And so coming out of the broom closet is not just coming out as a witch, but it's coming out as a person in this world that deserves to be seen that deserves to be respected, that people, uh, that you know that you can help people and that you have something to share with people to make the world a better place. So yes, we're reclaiming the word witch, but we're also coming into ourselves. We're giving ourselves permission to exist in the world and to say, hey, I have a lot to say. I have opinions that I want to share. I have a lot to offer people. And so here I am and I'm just going to show up and do it. Right? That's all we really want to do as business owners is we just want to help people, especially in this field. It's all about helping people. So my goal for this week is to really just get people out of the mindset that it's all about this, this next thing that they need to do to be able to show up in their business and really just flip the narrative to, okay, how can I help people? How can I show up to help people? And then everything else after that is just going to naturally fall into place, right? Am I right? Okay, so I have a couple of things for you today. Let me get that for you. Okay, so the first one is a worksheet that I have, and it has just four questions on it, and I want you to answer these questions into the group. You need to answer within 24 hours to be able to qualify for the prize, and you need to use the hashtag. So the first question is, when did you first know that you were a witch, and how did you know? Did you hide it, or did you embrace it, and why? What types of witches do you identify with the most? So go back over, you know, what we were talking about. Are you secular, non-secular, atheist, agnostic, solitary? Are you a new witch? Are you a um, hereditary witch? You know, that sort of thing. And then I also have a um, 
quiz that I want you all to take, let's see, that I put together. It's just a seven question quiz and it won't take you more than maybe two minutes. And it's going to show you a little bit more about how you can actually help people. Okay, so here is the worksheet, worksheet link. Please use broom closet one hashtag because what I'm going to do is I'm going to search in the group and by using that hashtag and so I can get everybody in the same place. We're getting to the point where we almost have 600 people in this group now. So the way I had been doing things before is just not going to be sustainable. So I need everybody on board. Please, at the very least, use the hashtag or if you are like hashtags, what is that? Like your mind just exploded. Just go to the pin post for today and just comment under the pin post. Okay. So download this, get that, fill that out, write about it, post it in the group. And then I also want you to take this quiz and tell us what your results are. Do you agree with it? Do you not agree with it? How do you feel about it? Um, it's going to show you what your element of power is. Okay. So awesome. I will see everybody tomorrow. Same place, same station. Thank you for hanging out with me and I had so much fun. I will see you in the Facebook group.